It's time to begin. Would you stand with me, please, and let's sing this little chorus that we did last time. Lord, send a revival. Lord, send a revival. Lord, send a revival. And let it begin in me. One more time. Lord, send a revival. Lord, send a revival. Lord, send a revival. And let it begin in me. Glad to have you here. Let's remain standing. We're talking about the heart that God revives. We began with this passage, Isaiah 57, 15. Let's read it. For thus says the high and lofty one who inhabits eternity, whose name is holy, I dwell in the high and holy place with him who has a contrite and humble spirit to revive the spirit of the humble and to revive the heart of the contrite ones. Let's pray. Lord, may you add your blessing to the reading of your word. We thank you for these who have gathered here tonight. And those that were here this morning, we pray your blessings upon our time together. I ask, Lord, that you would be with uh, some of our church family who uh, are ill. I uh, pray for Addie Lewis's husband, Phil. I pray, Lord, for Brother Don Schoolcraft, who had surgery today, and ask that you would be with them. Uh, Thank you for everyone who's here, and thank you for the improvement we're seeing in those who've had some health issues. But Lord, we need to hear from you tonight, and I want to be a blessing this evening, and I hope you'll help me to speak clearly and to be understood. In Jesus' name we pray and for his sake. Amen. You may be seated. Last time we looked at this verse, and it tells us what kind of heart God revives. It's the person who has a contrite or a broken, crushed, humiliated, ground-to-powder spirit, and a humble heart, uh, one that is deeply embedded, low in height, of little value in standing. That's how we have to look at ourselves, and that's how God wants us to feel about our sin. And the heart God revives is the one who is humbled and contrite and broken. And so we also looked last time that I thought was going to just be an introduction, but we looked at Luke chapter 7 about the woman who came and broke the alabaster box and wiped uh, Jesus' feet with her hair and how that was a picture of uh, repentance. We want to look at Luke chapter 15 tonight. There are three or four stories in this passage or four parables that Jesus gives that I think you'll recognize. Notice beginning with verse 1. Then all the tax collectors and the sinners drew near to him to hear him. And the Pharisees and scribes complained, saying, This man receives sinners and eats with them. He spoke this parable to them, saying, What man of you, having a hundred sheep, if he loses one of them, does not leave the ninety-nine in the wilderness and go after the one which is lost until he finds it? And when he has found it, he lays it on his shoulders, rejoicing. And when he comes home, he calls together his friends and neighbors, saying to them, Rejoice with me, for I have found my sheep which was lost. I say to you that likewise there will be more joy in heaven over one sinner who repents than over ninety-nine just persons who need no repentance. Now I want you to look back up in the verses 1 and 2 And you'll notice who is there. There is a collection of two groups of people. First of all, there are publicans and sinners. And I said publicans, not republicans. Okay. Uh, There may have been some Democrats there too, but who knows. But uh, anyway, the tax collectors and people who knew they were sinners, they were there. And then on the other side, there's a religious group. You've got the scribes and Pharisees 
who were there. And so these two groups are together. And this one religious group, the, there are, the sinners are listening to Jesus, but the folks of the religious group are murmuring. That's an interesting word, isn't it, to murmur? Have you ever heard people murmur? People do, who do not have broken, contrite hearts, they murmur. They complain. They're always murmuring. And these folks, the Pharisees, were constantly criticizing Jesus because of his life and his manner and his ministry and his message. And so religious, self-righteous people do that. So Jesus gives us three stories in light of these two groups to try to help both of them. And so um, God's concern is over those who are broken over their sin. So if we want revival in our own hearts, we need to be broken over our own sin that we have. And notice these stories. First of all is the lost sheep. The lost sheep. Look at verse 4. What man of you, having a hundred sheep, if he loses one of them, does not leave the ninety and nine in the wilderness and go after the one which was lost until he finds it? And when he has found it, he lays it on his shoulders, rejoicing. And when he comes home, he calls his friends and neighbors together, saying, Rejoice with me, for I have found my sheep, which was lost. Now, I don't know a lot about sheep, but my dad traded something, I don't know what he traded, for a hundred goats. He had a hundred Angora goats. If you know, they're long-haired goats. And we had pigs, and we had horses, and we had cows, and we had dogs and cats, and that kind of thing. But I don't know anything about sheep. But I know a little bit about goats. We had a hundred of them, and one of them was born on Christmas Day, and the previous owners named him Chris Kringle. When you start naming goats, you get problems. Because the issue was, he thought he belonged in the house. And my cousin Jerry was staying with us at the time, and we had a porch, a screened-in porch that went on two sides of the house. And they put a bed out there for Jerry so he could sleep during the summertime. And he was working for my dad and trying to make a little money to get ready for college or whatever he wanted. He wanted to buy a car or something. I don't remember. But anyway, he was there. And this goat, every time you got close to leaving the door open, this goat would get in the house. And for whatever reason, it would get right in the middle of Jerry's bed. And so, you, you know, you, and the goats... They, they have bad breath, smell like they've been eating garlic and onions all the time. and I, I mean, they can be a nuisance. They'll eat anything, just about. They'll eat just about anything. So I think Dad got them to kind of eat down the pasture. One thing that cattle people didn't like was when the sheep herders came the cattlemen and the sheepmen got in trouble because of the way the sheep ate the grass. So, anyway, regardless of that, we got a lost sheep. If we had a lost goat, we just looked in the house because that's where it was, right? But in this case, I want you to notice that this sheep kind of wandered away on its own. We don't know what happened. I, I do know something about it. sheep are kind of dumb. And uh, if you hold a a stick, a broom handle or a stick in front of a herd of sheep and the first one jumps over it, you can remove the stick and all of them will keep jumping. They, they just do whatever's in front of them. They're, that's the way sheep are. That's kind of the way people are sometimes, isn't it? All we like sheep have, we have turned everyone to his own way. That happens sometimes. So, Notice, we aren't sure exactly what happened. The scripture doesn't give us the details, but somehow this sheep was lost. However, the shepherd searched until he found him. That's a great thing about the good shepherd, amen? The good shepherd, John says, gives his life for the sheep. 
Boy, what a picture that is. Now notice in the next verse, verse 7. I say unto you that likewise there will be more joy in heaven over one sinner who repents than over 99 just persons who need no repentance. What is Jesus saying here? The Lord is saying there will be joy in heaven. Why? Not over the 99 people who don't think that they've done anything wrong, but over the one who repents. The thing that brings joy to the heart of God is that one person will realize their lost condition, will repent of their sin, and trust Jesus Christ as their Savior. The Bible says there's more rejoicing over that one than over 99 who, who need no repentance. So, see what Jesus is saying. You know, you look down your noses at the, at the uh, publicans and sinners thinking that you're better than they are. He's, that's what he's saying to the scribes and Pharisees. But they are broken, and they are repenting. Why? Because they need me, and they know it. And so I have joy over them and not you. You think you have it all together. You have no needs. You're like the Laodiceans in Revelation 3.17 because you say, I am rich, I become wealthy, and I have need of nothing and do not know that you are wretched, miserable, poor, blind, and naked. Until we realize that there are things in our lives that we need to repent of, we will still be lost. The truth is, there's nothing we, we can do nothing without the Lord. We are nothing without Him, and that's important. Verse 7 says there will be rejoicing over one who comes. Now, that's the first Less, lesson that Jesus gives here, the first story, the first parable. The next one is the lost silver. Look at verse 8. Or what woman having ten silver coins, if she loses one, does not light a lamp, sweep the house, and search carefully until she finds it? And when she has found it, she calls for her friends and neighbors together, saying, Rejoice with me, for I have found the peace which was lost." This woman had 10 silver coins. Likely they were stranded and on a headpiece that was likely a wedding gift from her husband. And she's minding her own business in her house, but somehow she realizes that there's only nine on her little headpiece. And she's lost one of them. So what does she do? That, well, the, this coin was probably in a row of 10 on her headpiece as a wedding gift from her husband. It was valuable because it was silver. It was precious to her because her husband gave it to her. It was a sign to others that she was a married woman. And losing one of them, it would be like your wife losing her wedding ring or something like that. That's the idea that this is talking about. So what did she do? Patsy's dad had preached on this sermon and said the first thing she did was to strike a candle. And so she, she lit a lot. She, she got a flashlight out of the drawer, right? Started looking around. She struck a candle. She swept the house. That's one way to clean your house is to lose something, right? And then she searched until she found the lost silver. Don't you hate it when you lose anything? Oh, man, that drives me nuts. Uh, Monty Moose lost his car keys uh, here a couple of Sundays ago, and we looked all over the church trying to find him. He said he had him in a, with his baseball cap that says Grandpa on it, you know. And so we looked. We couldn't find it. He found him at home, you know. Uh, today, Brother Don told me I met him in the parking lot at the hospital over here, and and uh, he said, I found my billfold. I said, you did? That's great. He'd called me and asked me to pray that we'd, that we'd find it. So I did. I said, Lord, would you help them to find it? And then, of course, you know, when everybody, anybody loses something, you ask them all these important questions. Where did you have it last? You'd say, if I knew where I had it last, I would go there and get it. So, you know, I tried not to say helpful things like that, but they, you know, they got on the phone because he remembered having it at the uh, radiology department at the hospital. They called up there, and sure enough, they found his wallet. It's always a joy when you lose something and you find it. You hate to lose anything, right? 
But when you find it again, there's rejoicing. Well, that's what this woman did. She said, I found it. I found it. Why? It was valuable. It was important to her. It was precious to her. And so the parable tells us that everyone is precious to God. Now, if you had 10 kids, that'd be a miracle and you would be amazing. But if you lost one of them, I mean, I said, well, that was, the, you know, that was the middle child, and he was always trouble. That's okay. Let someone else. Have. No. No. Could I tell you about a woman who lost a child? Her, I won't tell you her, her uh, name, but her initials are Patsy Gortney. And um, <laughs> we were living in a basement apartment just about a mile and a half from the church when I pastored in Kansas City. And I went out the door with both girls. She thought I only took Brooke. And she came out of wherever she was, the bedroom or wherever, and could not find Fawn. And she was panicked. And she, w she did something she would never do. She flagged somebody down to give her a ride to the church. And when she found that I had both girls, she just melted down the wall to a puddle with relief. She was, she thought, honestly, she thought she, Fawn had gotten out and somebody had taken her. Well, it was me. <laughs> if anybody got in trouble, it would have been me. But listen, why was that? Those girls are precious to us. We, we don't think, you know, well, you know, we still have got Brooke. You, no, you don't think that way. All of your children are precious to you. Listen, this woman was concerned about one silver coin because it was precious to her. This tells me that everyone is valuable to God. Every one of us are valuable to the Lord. He wants everyone to be ready when the bridegroom comes for his bride. Amen? He wants that. Everyone is valuable to him, and it means every person is a candidate for salvation by grace through faith. Everyone is. Why? Because Jesus died for everybody, not just Okies. Amen? Not just Arizonans. He died for everybody. And that's important for us to know. Sometimes, you know, we, we need to go looking for people because there's somebody that we know that does not know Jesus. Amen? And boy, we need to share Jesus with them. So they're like the lost silver. And by the way, this silver was lost because of no fault of its own. Think of that. The sheep wandered off. People do that from time to time, don't they? They wander away. But the silver was lost through no fault of its own. Something to think about. Notice verse 10. Likewise, I say to you, there is joy in the presence of the angels of God over one sinner who repents. So one brings joy in the presence of the angel. Why? Because of repentance. Let's look at the third one. There's the lost son. This is a favorite story of Patsy's dad. He used to preach on the prodigal son all the time. I want you to notice it. I'm sure you're familiar with the story, but look in verse 11. Then he said, a certain man had two sons, and the younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the portion of goods that falls to me. So he divided to them his livelihood. Now, think about what is happening here. This young man is really being rebellious. And he's being disrespectful, and he's being hateful to his dad. And he says, Dad, I want you to give me what's due me if you were dead. I'm wishing you were dead. I want what's coming to me right now. Boy, can you believe that? Kind of a hard-hearted cuss, isn't he? And, uh, and so we live 
in one of the most disrespectful generations that I've known. I, I mean, I was talking to my cousin, Lisa, who is a teacher in Oklahoma, and she was telling me, I said, kids are not the same as they were when you and I. I said, I know. I said, I wouldn't want your job. I'd be guilty of giving one of them a knuckle sandwich first time they lift, lipped off to me. I, I mean, I wouldn't put up with that. I, I just, you say, but pastor, you're so not. No. No, if, it, if I see, I get aggravated at when I see kids in the grocery store that are misbehaving. And, and I want to go slap the parent. That's what I want to do. That's, you did this. You raised them. You caused them to be this way. Amen? I mean, that's the problem. So th this guy had a hard heart. And, and it, was a, it was a problem. And what this young man did was saying, Dad, I wish you were dead, and I wish I had what's my inheritance that's coming to me. And so just give it to me now. I'm getting out of this place. So the father divided to both of his sons his livelihood. Now look at verse 13. And not many days after, the younger gathered all together and journeyed to a far country. And there wasted his possessions with prodigal living. The King James Version says riotous living. Um, what did he do? We're not exactly sure. The Bible doesn't give us details. The brother... Hints of that a little bit later, but the Bible tells us that the word there for prodigal living means wasteful living. That he wasted. How many of you know people that if they had a million dollars, they'd be poor as Job's turkey in 30 days? You know people like that. They can't handle money. They don't know how to, you know, they'd spend it all on whatever. You know, there's some people that, if they would just think a little bit. Now, look, don't listen. Or, no, don't listen. Listen to me. Don't misunderstand me is what I meant to say. If you, listen, if you're living in your car, you don't need a German Shepherd dog. Hello? You don't need that. And, you, you, <laughs> you know, there have been many times when somebody would drive up in some rattle trap of a car and uh, I watch them drive up, and they got a carton of cigarettes on the dash of their car. And they're wanting a handout from the church. I'm thinking, if you just stop smoking, you'd have more money. Amen. You know? I mean, good night, nurse. Uh, you say, well, well, Pastor, do you think you can go to hell for smoking? I, no, but you can smell like you've been there. You know, uh, that, that's the deal. That's... Here's the thing. Of course, if you keep smoking, you may get there ahead of the rest of us, right? But here, here's the deal. You know, there's some people that don't have any common sense about things. And so, anyway, they, they live wasteful lives. They have nothing to show for it. And so, what does verse 14 say? Notice what happened. But when he, and by the way, could I tell you the far country doesn't have to be another state it could be in the same town where your parents live. Hear me. It, it, really, you get away from God. It doesn't mean you have to get out of state or out of the country. Now, we know the Bible says he went to a far country, but I'm telling you, you can get away from God right at home. And it's important to think about that. So, notice what it says. But when he had spent all, there arose a famine in that land, and he began to be in want. And you know, I'm sure this guy was the life of the party as long as he had money. You know, as long as you have money, there are lots of leeches that'll suck you dry. Hello? You know what I'm talking about, don't you? <laughs> some of you have been there, and some of you have been that, you know? Yeah, listen, it, it, is, it is amazing how people get... And when they get away from God. And so he began to be in want. And then he went and joined himself to a citizen of that country. And he sent him into his fields to feed the swine. We were talking at lunch today about pigs. Jim, um, I can't even think of their last name now. Peters. Jim Peters and I were talking about it. 
He used to raise Hampshire's and Yorkshire pigs. I raised Hamps and Chester Whites. Do you know the difference between a Chester White and a Yorkshire pig? How many of you know Green Acres, the show on TV the, with Eddie? On? Okay, Arnold Ziffel was a Yorkshire pig because his ears were up. Chester Whites, their ears are down. Now you know a little bit about animal husbandry. Don't go buy any pigs, though. But anyway, pigs are just that. I mean, the nearest mud hole they'll find, they'll get it. You can, you can wash a pig, and we used to do that, get them ready for show. We'd wash a pig, get them real clean, and then for the Hampshires, on the black part, you know, the Hampshires are the one that have the white belt around. On the black part, you put mineral oil on it. And boy, they're, they just shine. And you get black pulp, shoe polish and put it on their feet, on their hooves. And then you get white shoe polish and paint that belt around them. And you can put a ribbon around them and perfume them, but they're still pigs. And as soon as they can get in the mud hole, they're going to do that. There you go. So here's the thing. This is a Jewish boy <laughs> who, who couldn't have anything to do with pigs. Now, I am so glad I'm not Jewish because everything is better with bacon. Amen? Amen. Can you say, we go to a place over in, in uh, uh, Gilbert called Mexico, and they have what they call a Mexican Twinkie. It is a jalapeno filled with cream cheese and wrapped in bacon and grilled. And oh, they're, they're good. Amen. And uh, I, get, I get one for Patsy. I brought one home to her one time and she said, what is this? I had it wrapped up in a napkin. I said, it's a Mexican Twinkie. And I handed it to her and of course she loves it. She, she's a pepper belly anyway, but uh, boy, she likes that. But everything is better with bacon, I think. You know, I, even, you know, I like to eat breakfast at night sometimes, amen? Oh, amen. And uh, anyway, here's the deal. This Jewish boy got a job feeding pigs. And I'm telling you, from raising pigs myself, even the food that I bought for them, there ain't nothing a pig eats that I want to eat. And this boy is looking over the fence into the pig pen and saying, you know, that don't look too bad, <laughs> what they're eating. Now, I don't know about you, but I have never been that hungry. Uh, there have been a time or two that I've been hungry, but I've never been that hungry where I wanted to eat what a pig would eat. This guy was on the bottom. Sometimes it takes hitting the bottom before you'll look up and realize you need Jesus. And so... Notice what happens. And he would gladly have filled his stomach with the pods that the swine ate, and no one gave him anything. He was probably panhandling. Probably asking, could, could I have just a, a few coins? I haven't had anything to eat in a few days. But notice, he spent all. There are some folks who have spent all. Now, I'm not, not necessarily talking about having a party and partying with their friends and spending their money on liquor and wild women and all that kind of... I'm not necessarily talking about that. I'm not saying that they've been involved in prostitution or had a drug habit or alcohol habit or anything like that. But there are folks who are wasted spiritually and they've spent all. And the Bible says... A severe famine in the land. You know, you listen to the news today, and you think about what's going on in the world, and of course, you know, there's always somebody who's saying, you know, well, the power grid is at stake, or the supply chain, and we could be looking at shortages on this and that, and that all may happen. Do you know that? Yes. We, we may, uh, SRP may go bankrupt, and we may be without power. Uh, the banks could all fail. America could be invaded again by the Chinese. We've already been invaded. We just don't know it. They bought a lot of property in this country. But anyway, here's the deal. 
even if all of that happens, God is still on the throne. You are still his child. He still loves you. If the worst happens in this world, God's people are going to be taken care of one way or another. Amen. Either we'll die and go to heaven or get killed and go to heaven or whatever. But if you know Jesus, everything's going to be fine. Amen? Now, let's go on. Here, here's the thing. This severe famine, the Bible says that those who are rebellious live in a dry land. This young man rebelled against his father and went to a place where there was a famine that came. And I'm saying, you say, but, but Pastor, I'm not an anarchist. I'm not trying to overthrow the government or my high school or anything or the law enforcement. You don't have to be a rioter in the street to be a rebel. Do you know you can be in church and be rebellious? Hello. There are some folks who come and are rebellious in church all the time. You say, over what? Well, some people are so tight. You know, if you want to kill a Baptist, just shoot them in the checkbook. Amen? I mean, there's some people that rather than doing what the Word of God says and giving like they ought to, they're sitting in rebellion every time the offering plate's passed. Or there's other things going on in their hearts. But just think about that for a minute. All you have to do is say no when God says go or keep when God says give. Amen? Or hate when God says love. That's all you have to do to be rebellious against God. Just go your own way instead of God's way. That's rebellion. And the Bible says rebellion is as the sin of witchcraft. Brother Patrick was in church today and I said, uh, Brother Patrick, do they practice witchcraft in Jamaica? And he nodded his head, yes, they do. And we, they practice it in America too. But the Bible says rebellion is like the sin of witchcraft. So, what did he do? Well, look at verse 15. He'd spent all their roses famine. He began to be in want. He joined himself to the citizen. He sent him into his field to feed the pigs, and he wanted to eat what the pigs ate. Nobody gave him anything. So what happens? He becomes broken. There are four steps to brokenness and repentance, and I want you to see them right quick. Number one, there's an acknowledgment of your need. An acknowledgement of your need. That's where it starts. You have to admit that you have a need. Amen? Notice he says, but when he came to himself, the light bulb turned on in his head, right? When he came to himself, he's looking over the fence into the pig pen and wanting to eat what the pigs eat, and he says, whoa, how many? Of my father's hired servants have bread enough and to spare, and here I am starving to death. He came to himself. He acknowledged he had a need. Can you think about him? I can't imagine eating what the pigs want. Would he? But he did. Secondly, there's an agreeing with God. There's an acknowledge. You have to acknowledge your need. I have a need, and this guy was starving. And then there's an agreeing with God. So what do you mean? Years ago, Pets and I were at a conference. I think it was in Ohio. And the conference was over. We had spent the night in the motel. We would got up, got ready, got dressed, ready to go. And I get on the interstate, and she says, Honey, I think you're going the wrong way. And what do I do? I looked over at her and said, Don't you think I know how to drive? And I keep going, and pretty soon there's a sign that says, I'm going the wrong way. So what do you do? You speed up. I'm going the wrong way, but I'm making good time, right? And then there's another sign, and then I'm thinking to my, do you ever have that cold, clammy feeling inside that maybe what your wife said was right, and you're wrong, 
And so you're driving along thinking, how can I turn this car around without turning around? And admitting my mistake. I finally got off at the next exit and apologized in sackcloth and ashes and got on the right road. You know, isn't that a picture of repentance? You're going the wrong way. You're going away from God. It doesn't have to be a big thing. You don't have to be a murderer. You don't have, you don't have to be an adulterer. You just say no when God says go. Or you keep when God says give. And you just say, God, I know better than you do. That's a rebellious person. You see, you've got to acknowledge that you have a need, and then you have to agree with God. God, I am wrong. I have broken your law. I do deserve the death penalty. I ask you to forgive me. Amen. All we like sheep have gone astray. We've turned everyone to his own way. Anybody here like me, I can get along with anybody as long as you do it my way. That's what we think. We want our way about things. But we have to agree with God that we're going in the wrong direction. That's repentance. Agreeing with God that what you've done is wrong and that you're going the wrong way. Then there's an act of your will. Notice in verse 18. I will arise and go to my father and say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and in your sight. I have sinned against heaven and before you and am no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me like one of your hired servants. Notice this boy thought it through. And he thought, even the help at dad's house have bread enough in despair. And here I am starving. He came to himself. You know, it's a wonderful thing when people can see themselves as God sees them, that they are lost and that they need to repent and come back to, to the Lord. Uh, he says, he works it out in his mind. He's thinking about wanting to eat what the pigs eat, and he comes to himself. And he says, this is what I'm going to, I'm going to go home. I'm going to tell dad, I've disgraced you. I've disgraced the family. I'm not even worthy to be called your son. But dad, if I could just get a job and just work here, that's what I'll do. Man. So he worked it out in his mind. And that's the place all of us need to be. If we want revival in our hearts, we get to the place where we agree with God and we acknowledge our need, and then it's an act of our will, and we turn around and go the other way. You say, well, I don't feel like being broken. I know it's a hard place to be, isn't it? Yes. It's a humbling place to be. It's not fun to be broken, but that was what's, that's what brings healing in our lives and our hearts. So, how many times have you heard someone say, and I hope nobody says this, when someone comes to the altar and they pray, and the first thing they ask them is, how do you feel? Wrong question. Why? Because feelings change. The question we need to ask is, why have you come to the altar? What did you do? I asked God to forgive me. What did God say he would do? He said he'll forgive. Then how do you know that God's forgiven you? Because God keeps his word. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Had a lady call me today and was asking about things in the Old Testament she, she said, I, I don't understand how God could tell Israel to go wipe out nations, killing everything, like when Saul was told to go kill the Amalekites and everyone, animals and everything. And he kept Agag, and he saved the best. And he was guilty of the sin of partial obedience, which is total disobedience when you don't do what God says. 
She said, I, I don't understand how God can do that. And I said, well, we need to understand that evil is repulsive to God. And there were times that God used Israel to get rid of evil among nations. There's also times when God used other nations to destroy Israel. Right? You, you know, there's some things about God that you and I don't understand. And that's a good thing. Because if I understood it all, I'd be God and you'd be sorry. Right? That's the thing. And she goes on to say, well, you know, I, I know that there are that there are people who say that the, the things in the Old Testament are just stories and that you just, you know, I, it's okay if you don't believe in a young earth. And I, I mentioned to her, I said, you know, there, there are viewpoints that people have that between the days of creation that they think that there are millions of years have passed. But I said, here's the important thing. If you can't believe what God tells you in the first 11 chapters of the book of Genesis, how can you believe God for salvation that you find out in the New Testament? You either believe it all or you don't believe it. And that seemed to help her. And, of course, I would encourage you, if you have questions about that, I would encourage you to go to Answers in Genesis and look at Ken Ham and... Um, the wonderful resources that they have available on creation and the first 11 chapters of Genesis. I, I'm telling you, uh, AnswersInGenesis.org, and they have wonderful stuff. And if you ever get a chance to go to Kentucky and see the Creation Museum and the Ark Experience, I would encourage you to go. It's fantastic. But listen, if you don't believe God about those things in the Old Testament, how can you believe that Jesus died, was buried, and rose again in the New Testament. If God would lie to you about the creation of the world, then wouldn't God be suspect about salvation as well? The truth is, God keeps his word. If you will do what his word says. It's like going to a doctor. You know, have you ever been to the doctor and he says, well, it could be this or it could be that. Here, take these pills. If this don't kill you, we'll try something else. Listen, going to the doctor today is a little bit of you kind of got to be on guard about what they're giving you. Hey, you just kind of got to watch. And, you, and don't misunderstand. If the doctor says to you, you know, I, I saw something on the x-ray I'm not too sure about. Let's do this other test. And you're thinking, he just wants money out of me. Maybe. But what if there is something? And what if a blood test shows that you have cancer? Would you go to the doctor and say, yeah, you know, well, uh, I, I know what the blood test says and I see it on the x-ray, but I don't feel bad at all. I feel fine. Is that what you'd do? No. You'd say, well, what do we need to do? What, what do I have? How much time do I have? Is there any treatment available? What can I do? Would you agree? That's what we would do if we go to the doctor. Look, that's an act of your will. You say, okay, I will submit to this treatment. You sign papers saying that it's okay if they bill your insurance and Medicare or whatever. It's an act of your will. This young man came to himself, and he went to do something as quickly as possible. Now, there's a final one, and then I'm going to close for tonight. By the way, Sometimes our sin is against God alone. And when we repent, we get that right with God. Sometimes our sin is not only against God, but it's against someone else. And we need to get those things right. Amen? Amen. To get a clear conscience, you go and you make things right as far as you can. Listen to me. Sometimes people won't forgive you. Right? Right? They won't forgive. Sometimes they won't. They'll harbor it. And it's wrong for them not to forgive. We know Jesus said, if you don't forgive men their trespasses, then the Heavenly Father won't forgive yours. Hello? 
So, boy, I want to be forgiving, don't you? I want to have a clear conscience before God and before others. A clear conscience is that nobody can look me in the eye and say, you offended me and you never tried to make it right. That's having a clear conscience. So, he goes, he talks to God. I'm sure he's praying all the way home. And he works out the wording in his mind. And he's going to go to dad and ask for a job. Notice the, oops, the attitude of the heart. Let's look at Luke 20, or 15, verse 20. And he arose and came to his father. And when he was still a great way off, his father saw him and had compassion. And ran and fell on his neck and kissed him. And I wish I had time to talk about this, but Patsy's dad used to talk about a couple sitting on the front porch of their house, and they'd sit out there and drink their coffee, and they would talk to each other and said, I wonder where he is and if he's okay. I haven't heard from him. I wonder if he's ever going to come home. And they cry out to God, and they ask God, to, Lord, keep your hand of protection on my boy. And, and he, would, he would describe in detail that one day, they're looking down the road, and there's someone coming. And by his gait and by his walk, they think, I believe that's him. And he gets a little closer, and it is him. And they run off the porch, and he grabs the pig pen smelling, hungry young man and embraces him. And rejoices and says, this, my son, was dead. He was lost and now he's found. But notice the son says in verse 21, Father, I've sinned against heaven and in your sight and am no longer worthy to be called your son. He didn't get all his, he didn't get all the words out because look what happened. The father said, bring out the best robe. Put it on him. Put a ring on his hand and sandals on his feet. And that calf that we've had held up and been feeding corn. Let's kill it and have a party. Why? Let's eat and be merry. For this my son was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. And they began to be merry. What a great picture. Now there's one more thing and I'll just give it to you and then we'll go. There's the loser son. The Bible calls him the elder brother. And let me skip to verse 25. Now the older son was in the field and he came and he drew near the house. And he heard music and dancing. So he called one of the servants and asked what these things meant. And he said to him, your brother has come. And because he has received him safe and sound, your father has killed the fatted calf. You'd think... He'd be happy about that, wouldn't you? My brother has come home. But notice, verse 28, he was angry and would not go in. Therefore, his father came out and pleaded with him. So he answered and said to his father, Lo, these many years I've been serving you and have never transgressed your commandment at any time. In the first place, the guy's mad. In the second place, he's lying. I have never transgressed your commandment at any time. He's a liar. Because he has. How many of you ever did something that your parents told you not to do? Right? And when you say, I have kept your commandments, he's lying. And you ne never gave me a young goat that I might make merry with my friends, let alone a calf. But as soon as this, as this son of yours came, he didn't even call him his brother. This son of yours, not my brother, who has devoured your livelihood with harlots, you killed the fatted calf for him. And we'll stop right there. But think about it for a moment. Jesus is using that part of the story to speak especially to the Pharisees. Because they thought they had no need of repentance. The heart God revives is when the lost one comes home who's broken in spirit and contrite in his heart and says, this is what I'll do. I'll go home and I'll say, God, 
I'm not worthy to be called your son. I've disgraced your name. I have violated your law. I deserve the death penalty. But I'm asking, will you forgive me? Could you give me a job? Amen. And by the way, the Lord does that too. He'll give you a place to serve if you'll serve. Amen. I wish we had time for more, but I will do my best to try to find Brother Roy's message. And uh, I, I thought we had it somewhere on a video, and uh, I'll try to make it available for you. But it's a great sermon, and um, I wish I could preach it like he did. But we'll be dismissed here. Take a look at your prayer list, and you can